Hello and welcome back to the Bravus podcast. In this edition, we're going to talk about light and uh, all things light-like. I have with me Keith. Hey, Keith, how are you? I'm great. How are you? So designers, builders, architects, I guess light is becoming a bigger and bigger thing for them, isn't it? It is. And it's actually one of my favorite things to talk about with them. It just affects so many of the, uh, the different things that they're focusing on as they're designing a property. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, given that light's a great thing to talk about, I'm going to introduce two guests uh, this time we have with us. We have Steve Glenn, who's the Director of Residential Systems from USAI. Hey, Steve. Well, hello, everybody. How are you? And I know I keep trying to call you Scott, but I shall try really hard not to do that. I, I, I will not be offended. Good. And also with uh, us is uh, Greg, uh, Greg Barrett. Greg, I got your title as General Manager of All Things Important and Essential. Is that about fair? I will let my boss know that that's my new title. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> and we'll see what uh, she has to say. But yeah, I am one of the product managers at USAI Lighting, I'm working on product development and making sure that it gets through in the hands of the customers. Great. So I thought we'd start uh, at quite a high level uh, with you guys and give me a sense of how long you've been uh, working in light or what got you into light uh, and what makes you excited by this area. So why don't you go first, Steve? Uh, wow. Uh, it's been a few years. So I actually started in 1984, the fall of 1984. I was going to college and I actually needed a job uh, to pay my way through college. So I started off by sweeping floors, assembling light fixtures in the back of a lighting showroom. Uh, since then, I've grown into uh, become a manufacturer's rep. Uh, I left manufacturing rep, went to work for Cooper Industries, uh, left Cooper and got to go to Lutron for 20 plus years. And then I got the opportunity to go to a, a startup called Ketra, uh, went through the acquisition there and uh, found myself at USAI, uh, which has uh, been uh, been a fantastic move. So interesting I, I, career, I know. But Excellent, Greg. What about you? Well, I actually got my start back in elementary school. Um, so I haven't <laughs> been doing it quite as long as Steve. But uh, we had a school-wide musical, and you're required to participate in the choir. And anybody who's heard me sing, you that wasn't pretty, even back then. So uh, I volunteered to run the light board, and that got me out of uh, being in the choir, and I've been doing it ever since. It was... Uh, this amazing blend between technology, science, and creativity that I just fell in love with. And so I ended up going to undergrad for theatrical lighting design. I worked um, as a freelance lighting designer and technician in New York for a few years. And then I started working for a systems integrator. And that got me interested in the architectural side of things. And what I love about the theater side of lighting is it allows you to tell stories and create emotions in people. But people are in spaces every single day and not all of those spaces are also designed to the same level of emotion and a care and attention to detail. So I wanted to be a part of that. So I went to Parsons for architectural lighting design for grad school. Uh, worked for a couple of firms in New York City before moving down to Austin, Texas um, as a product manager for that startup Ketra uh, along with Steve Glenn. And uh, that really uh, blended things in because my thesis was all about color changing and emotion. And that fell right in line with the startup mentality catcher. I was product manager there for four years. And when the acquisition happened, I knew that I wanted to bring my passion for color and light and emotion uh, to another company that was already doing something similar, USAI Lighting, and being able to blend all those together um, led me to where I am now. Okay, great. So let, let's uh, just talk about light for a minute, because if there's one area that I'm learning, at least, that has changed dramatically in the last few years, light is one of those areas. So I, I thought we should sort of go back five years and uh, tell us what what light and working in light looked like five years ago and how it might be different today. Steve, how, how, how would you contrast the difference? The, the difference in five years and what innovation has done to the LED market is incredible. Uh, the initial LED sources that we were used to seeing were screw and light bulbs. Uh, they were used because everyone wanted to be green and do the correct thing. Now the sophistication, the intelligence that are built into the light fixture uh, is vast. Uh, tunable sources that could adjust throughout the course of time or day uh, are critical. You no longer have that white light source that as you dim it down, it kind of grays out. It kind of now can warm up like an incandescent light bulb. 
Uh, and then on top of all these technologies that have happened over the last five years, the, the importance for an, an intelligent control system that can manage and navigate all those possibilities for the client is even more important than ever before. So Keith, I know if you have any thoughts from the designers and, and, and any questions from how things have changed from the way they look at them. Yeah, I think one of the most important things they always wanna know from our standpoint is how we can get that incandescent quality from an LED. And as you already said, that ability to do warm dim. Um, what have you seen as far as just the quality of light output, um, CRI and those things as far as how LEDs have advanced? So from my standpoint, uh, the, the early stages, they were a little rough. Uh, the quality of the light source was, I don't think what we'd expect, especially when you're dealing with clients uh, of a certain level and building a home of a certain value. They have very high expectations. Uh, and so where you're at today with that is you're going to take a, a warm glow product from 3000 uh, down to 2200 or maybe 2700K down to 2200 the dimming is smooth, uh, goes to a low end of 1%, uh, and it actually performs exactly like an incandescent source. As a matter of fact, the way it's designed, it follows the dimming curve of a halogen light source. So th that has what's changed. I'd say that USAI, if you ever did a Pepsi challenge, you put us against anybody else that's out there. Uh, we win that hands down. Uh, the quality replicates an incandescent to the point where we even have a demo, we have a test uh, that we give people. Can you tell the difference of which one's incandescent, which one's LED? And majority of the times they always lean and they, you ask them the question, which one's the LED? And they'll pick the incandescent. So I, I would say I agree with you, Keith. It, it's been a struggle, but where we're at today and where we've been at for the last few years uh, makes us a leader in the industry. And Greg, as a product manager, how, does, how do you see some of those changes? You know, as the product manager, I came into lighting at a great time. It was just the transition from the incandescent phase into LEDs. And as Steve Glenn mentioned, the CRI, the color rendering, the color quality just was not there. And USAI Lighting was one of the early adopters of LED technology to actually make it viable for architectural lighting um, to illuminate skin. It's all about how you look and how you feel in it. And now we're able to create any kind of color point that make colors pop, to make skin tones pop. You're talking about color rendering that is better in many cases than traditional incandescent sources um, to make spaces look the best. And one of the things that I love is that the possibilities are limitless. And where we're going and the level of control that we're now getting, companies like Savant and other controls, are allowing lights to do things that they were never able to do before. And all the world's a stage, and now we can actually have real theatrical lighting in it and make it look the best. Excellent. So let, let's think about someone. If you were building a new house, if you were with a client who was about to build a new house today, what are some of the things you guys think they should really consider? You've talked about some of them, but give, give us the sense of the advice you'd give to a new home builder today in terms of what they should think about when they're specking out with their architect light? Well, the number one thing that I would say to anybody embarking on building a new home is hire a specialist. Um, architects are incredibly talented and many architects actually have lighting specialists on their own team. But having someone that's dedicated solely to thinking about how a space looks, how it feels, how it functions with your life uh, day in, day out for all the different tasks you need um, it's um, uncomparable. You need that dedicated expertise. Um, all those things that Steve Glenn mentioned with the possibilities of light and controls, if you, they're not applied correctly, they don't get utilized. So you need that specialist. So that's the number one thing that I would recommend to anybody. Um, the next thing that I would really um, emphasize is don't just go with one type of light. Uh, don't just put one light in the center of your room or just have down lights. Uh, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make um, is they'll look at a layout of a home and they'll put in a lot of down lights and they're lighting the floor. But we don't see our space looking around down at the floor. We're looking out, we're looking at walls, we're looking at artwork. And 
that's why you need different layers. So uh, a company like USAI, where we have recessed downlights, there's all the layers of adjustable accents, wall washes. And then once you have the walls illuminated and your artwork and those features illuminated, you need additional layers. So you need the decorative layer. You also need things like under cabinet to help add sparkle and give a space definition and focus. So one of the big things that I see is a lot of people skimp out on lighting. And it takes a lot of different types of light to make a space feel well designed. No, Greg, yeah. let, Greg let, me, let me add to that also. What Greg was talking about is spot on, but there's also that the marketplace that right now exists or we're hearing a lot more of because of the conditions we're in, uh, that people are looking to renovate and do refurbishing of their homes. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of times we overlook and we forget to talk about lighting in that renovation. Uh, I think a lot of times the thought is that potentially that the wiring needs to be changed, replaced, additional wires need to be run. And today, we don't necessarily have to do that. Uh, there are some technologies that will require additional, but from the most basic warm dim solution, like Keith was just mentioning, uh, uses the, uses the existing wires, so nothing has to change, nothing is uh, added. You're really just swapping out the technology. So that's something that I think uh, more dealers need to address. And I'll piggyback on Steve Glenn here when you're talking, especially about retrofits. Another mistake that I see everybody make is they'll run out to Home Depot. Um, when an LED bulb runs out and they'll just pick up a bulb off the shelf, but the color doesn't match. Um, maybe they'll grab a cool white, so like a 4,000 Kelvin cool daylight or uh, instead of a warm white uh, or an incandescent style 2,700 or 3,000 Kelvin. And consideration of the color temperature in your space so that it feels designed, so it feels consistent. Um, that's a large mistake that I see a lot of homeowners make. But, you know, one of the things I always wonder about is that I talk to my friends, and they say, well, I, you know, I can go to Home Depot and I can buy a Philips Hue and, you know, I don't need to spend all this money on sophisticated lighting. I can sort of do it myself. But there's a huge experiential difference, isn't there? How do you guys sort of explain in that situation how the experience is going to be different? Well, right. uh Steve, do you want me to take this one? I, I, I don't know. I think we're both ready to pounce on this one, but yeah. uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so I think that anybody who wants to take it on themselves, um, it's an admirable start because coming from my background where it's very hands-on is to know light, you have to play with it. And the nice thing about a do-it-yourself market is when you're starting to play with it, you start to notice what an impact it makes. And then when you take it to a professional level, where you have a specialist that's coming in and talking to you about how do you want to live your life? Where are you doing your daily activities? Is there a task light there for this? Um, is the beam angle on this piece of artwork right? Am I making the reds in your closet pop and look the best? Um, when you're uh, getting ready for the day, can you change your light so that if you're going out for a nice evening, you know what you're going to look like versus if you're going out in the middle of the day. There's a lot of considerations and nuances that just take time. And that's something that a dedicated specialist can bring to your project. You would never get in the do it yourself market. Um, and that's only on the design side. On the product side, there's a whole nother level of quality, of performance, of lifetime, longevity. Um, a lot of light uh, fixtures out there will last over 50,000 hours. Uh, when you're looking at the do-it-yourself LED market, you're looking in the 20,000, 30,000 hours, which is still a decent amount of time, but the color consistency changes, the beam optics change. It's just not the same. It's the difference between driving a, a Camry and driving a Lexus. And, and Steve, these sorts of things, sometimes they really have to be seen to be believed, don't they? Oh, my gosh, do they ever. I mean, lighting and in this tunable world that we live in uh, it's all about the experience and it's an emotional uh, experience once you get it done right for those dealers out there that are, are installing lights inside their residence or inside their showrooms and they are living with it they understand how it impacts their daily lives theirs their children their spouses uh, it is one of the most emotional experiences you have if done even at, at the smallest level 
Um, and I would say that if you're a dealer and you sell high-end speakers, uh, you know, the audio and the video world, it's a very emotional sale. And they need to look at this the very similar way. Uh, when a person is in that environment and they see their skin tone look radiant or vibrant uh, and not washed out, uh, that, that's, that's part of that decision-making they go to. Uh, I always like to refer to when you pick out your countertops and your rugs and your fabrics and sometimes even your clothes that you wear in the morning. A lot of times you have to take them to the window or take things outside to see what they truly look like. If you don't have that light source inside, that fabric that you selected in the showroom or that countertop you saw where it was at is not going to look the same as when you purchased it in your home. And so to bring that light source, the natural light, into your home, to hit the right light source, the right quality light at the time of day, uh, is, is essential. And again, I can't say emotional enough, and it is definitely an emotional experience. So, Keith, one of the things we talk a lot about at work at Abravas is we're trying to get into this idea of the health benefits. How, how, do, you, how do you think we should best approach asking our guests about about health and wellness and whether that makes sense in terms of light. What, what are your thoughts? That's a good question. Uh, I guess the first place to start is just, is it true? I mean, we hear a lot of people saying that light affects our health, but what have you seen as far as studies out there? Uh, is there any proof that, that uh, light really does affect how we live in our homes? That's a great question, and yes, um, there is definitive scientific evidence um, from numerous institutions that light directly impacts our health. Um, the impact on our sleep-wake cycle um, is it's one of the largest uh, impactors of our sleep-wake cycle is the presence or absence of certain blue wavelengths of light. And I think what can be a little misleading, though, and where some companies go with their marketing is they talk about the light as the solution. And it's not quite as simple as that. Uh, we evolved under daylight and we um, spent a millennia evolving under that, but introducing a certain lighting product doesn't change our behaviors. It doesn't change how we're actually experiencing it. So when you're looking at health and light and wellness, it needs to be a three-pronged approach. You need to have the right product to deliver the light correctly. But then it also needs to be designed to make sure that it's getting to the person itself. And then that person also has to be educated to make sure that they're not turning things off. Yeah. Uh, before, before we go to Steve, um, just talking about that three-pronged approach, can you tell me how you see lighting control, good lighting design, and then the fixture selection and that technology, how those go together, how they dovetail together? That's a great follow-up. Yes, all of those completely dovetail together because you need the fixture that can deliver adequate amounts of light to the human eye. Uh, that's where those photoreceptors are that um, influence our circadian cycle. So the light needs to be placed in the right location in the room. You also have to work with interior designers. If you're lighting your space in dark mahogany uh, and covering your space in dark mahogany, that light is not bouncing the same way that if your space was light. So you need to bring in your architect, you need to bring in your interior designer, um, your lighting specialist to make sure that the light is installed in the right spot. Um, and then it's not just a one size fits all type of approach, as you mentioned with controls, is the need for light, it mimics the sun. So shortly after waking up, we need a lot of light delivered to our eye. That's what suppresses that hormone melatonin. It allows us to wake up. But before you go to sleep, you need to eliminate a lot of those wavelengths of light. So that's where something like Savant's daylight mode um, come into play, where you have an automated control that can automatically tune the lights throughout the course of the day to adjust the light levels you're getting. Um, and making that a seamless experience is something that's going to really lead to adoption and help improve sleep. Steve, you have anything? Yeah, let me add a little bit to it because the, the, the biggest nightmare and challenge that I think dealers have faced and part of the reason why some of them have been a little slow entering into the world of lighting uh, is because there's been this challenge of you have a fixture, you have a driver, 
and you have a control system, and they have not all been tested uh, and configured together as one complete system. And historically, uh, at the end of the day, when somebody moves into their home and something doesn't operate the way they anticipated it should, uh, the finger gets pointed at the dealer. Uh, let's just be blunt. Uh, they're the ones that have to clean up all the messes, and they may not have pro provided the fixtures. They may not have done the physical install of the, the lighting control system, but they did the programming. Uh, and then the fixture manufacturer gave them a driver that may not have been correctly aligned with the dimmer source, uh, the typology there. So how do you get around that? And I think that's something that we've worked really hard at USAI with Savant to give the dealers, give those folks uh, a system that's been correlated so that right out of the box, when they order something, they know it's already been tested, approved, exactly with the dimmer that they're using and they're required to. So look, obviously a lot's changed in the last five years. Uh, guys, why don't you project yourself forward five years? Tell me what sort of technology you think is most interesting, what's coming around the corner, what's next in light? Well, for me on the product management side, I think the trend towards low voltage lighting is really encouraging. Um, not requiring electricians to have to run 120 volt or 277 uh, volt on commercial projects to every single fixture, I think has a lot of potential possibilities um, with the control side of things, as well as with the efficiencies of the light fixture and where that's going. And then additionally, I think color tuning. Um, USAI has an infinite color product um, and where the trend in color research, color science is going, I really think that light has long been a personal thing, but I really think that soon everybody will be able to have their own personal light. Very similar to how everybody has their own Instagram filters, everybody has their own favorite settings. The same thing could be true with reality, and I can't wait to see everything looking its best. Can you tell us a little bit more about Color Rendering Index, the CRI that we're talking about? Yes, yeah, so Color Rendering Index um, is a scale that was developed approximately 40, 50 years ago that uses incandescent light sources as an ideal illuminant source, and it's a reference based on that ideal illuminance. So it's ranked on a... Uh, scale from 0 to 100, with 100 being a perfect match to that incandescent source, and anything lower than that being slightly, deviated, uh, slightly deviating. So typically for most architectural applications, you're looking for a CRI of 80 or above. However, for residential applications, I would look for 90 or above. And for certain things like artwork, um, you're even going to try for a 95 CRI or above. So when we talk about really high quality light, obviously the best light source we have is the sun. How does your system, how does a tunable light system work to improve the way we see sunlight in our homes, the way we uh, incorporate natural light into the space? So the sun, as you mentioned, is the best uh, source of illuminance that we have. And the reason for that is because it has a full spectrum, which means that energy is in is present in every single wavelength of the visible spectrum. So when you think of a rainbow, all of those ranges of colors from the reds, oranges, yellows, greens, um, blues, and violets, it's all present in white light. Um, however, with artificial light sources, that spectrum isn't as evenly uh, pro provided. So incandescents, they tend to be heavier on the red wavelengths and lacking in the blue. Um, Fluorescent fixtures, you tend to see spikes and a lot of dead space, which is why people don't look their best under fluorescent light. LEDs are really nice because they're able to be a broad spectrum source, but you're also able to tune how much in different wavelengths they have. So more warm or more cool. And then you have products that can actually um, combine multiple sources of LED. So USAI's Color Select, they have a warm white and a cool white LED. So they're filling in all of those sources of wavelength. Um, when you get into more color changing products like Infinite Color Plus, they'll actually have a red, a green, a blue, and a white light source. So you're covering all of those wavelengths to make sure that anything you're lighting has wavelengths that can reflect and make things look their best. When you say color tuning, I think probably a lot of people think 
bright colors, parties, disco. But we've considered CRI kind of the end all be all of what good light mm-hmm. looks like. But I guess what you're implying is that there can be a better white light that most accurate isn't necessarily the best for a space. Exactly. So, yeah. So you mentioned CRI. So CRI is based on an incandescent light source as the ideal reference. So having a perfect score, which is 100, just means that you look as close to that incandescent source as possible. But they've done so many studies and people actually think whites look whiter when you're not at that incandescent color point. And so there's been a lot of research. There's actually some new metrics out there. Uh, TM30, uh, which we won't get into too many details about, but those have a lot more information about how does that light actually make things look. And there's a lot of other things where white light is just not white light. We already talked about color temperature where it's warmer, you might feel relaxed. If it's cooler, more like daylight, you feel energized, you feel invigorated. So white is the shifting point on a spectrum. It's not just one thing. And LEDs have unlocked that potential that before with halogen and incandescent, nobody ever had before. So I think that that's really exciting. Steve, how about you? What are you what are you excited by? Uh, similar to Greg, it's the tunability. Um, I, I know CRI is a big conversation and topic, but if I like a high CRI and I view that as the optimal way to go, but I want to have candlelight for my dining experience, uh, I lose my CRI. Uh, I'm not going to have that high quality CRI. So people need to understand how CRI should be applied and used and considered uh, that there are times and instances that CRI should not be the primary conversation. Uh, Maybe for the general daily light, yes. Uh, For me, as far as exciting and beyond the tunability, it's got to be where the technology is going on a wireless communication uh, and some DMX uh, wireless uh, devices so we can eliminate some of those CAD5, CAD6 cables. I think that's going to be a game changer, uh, especially for the dealers, uh, how they install and the simplicity of installing. So I think that's something that's in the very near future, uh, and I think it will be a, a true game changer. Well, okay. And Nigel, if I may, yeah. just a follow up. So Steve mentioned something about CRI, CRI isn't the end all be all, especially if you're looking for a candlelight atmosphere. And earlier he had brought up the concept of tabletops and cabinets. And one of the things that I want to make sure that all of your listeners and viewers know is that every object, every material that we see has certain wavelengths that it reflects the best. So, for instance, a dark wood cabinet um, is going to reflect more of those warm tones. And so if you light your space in those warm color temperatures, it's going to look richer. It's going to look more luxurious. Um, versus if you're going with a higher color temperature. If you're light, same thing with pieces of red and artwork. Um, things that are blue, for, on the other hand, under cool daylight, those start to really pop. And so CRI isn't the end all be all. Sometimes you just have to use your eyes and make everything look its best. Okay, well, I'm going to try and bring us all back and uh, and sort of wrap this engine up. And we have this sort of game we play with our our visitors. We ask them three questions. We'll ask everyone the same three questions. So uh, I'm going to ask you two, our two guests, thank you very much for doing this. The, the three questions, see what you think. The first question is, what is the gadget or piece of home technology that you think you couldn't live without? You want to take this first, Steve? This one is easy. It- the gadget I have to have uh, is the one that keeps the wife happy. And we recently moved to uh, for our son's school, and we are currently in a rental apartment. But one thing that had to go with us to the rental apartment uh, is the tunable light source in the kitchen and dining areas. So that was a mandatory must-have. Uh, she cannot stand seeing this light source in the kitchen that is always bright, glary white light. She's gotten so accustomed to it. Uh, so for my own well-being, I'd have to say that is that's probably my number one uh, must-have. So no Greg, what about, about what about you, Greg? What's your well, gadget? It doesn't well, have to be light. It could be anything. Well, I'd say that I probably have two, though. The first is uh, my uh, smart lock. Uh, the ability to unlock it from... I have two young kids, and I'm often carrying them inside the front door. So being able to unlock the lock from the phone 
from my phone in the car and then carry my kids inside. That's a lifesaver. It was a game changer when I first got the smart lock. And then uh, the second one, uh, I'll go actually back to lighting. But um, again, two young kids. I don't get a lot of sleep at night. And so having daylight mode in my bedroom. So Steve mentioned his kitchen, his living room. For me, it's the bedroom. Having the lights turn on automatically before I'm supposed to wake up, I think that saved me from not getting fired for being late. Uh, it keeps it wakes me up in the morning, uh, even in the middle of the winter, and that's a lifesaver. Well, that's great. So, Greg, uh, is there a project? The second question is: Is there a project you've worked on or a, a client's house you've been to where you just went, "Wow"? Is there an example of a a place you think that really makes the technology shine that you've worked on? A client's house or a home that I've worked on. Um, so, I've worked on a several different um, homes. I've worked on different projects. But there was a townhouse um, in Gramercy Park in New York that I worked on several years ago. And um, this space was so tailored to the individual customer's needs um, that it just blew me away. And every consideration was taken. Um, for instance, the client had a certain chair, the certain t uh, table that they like to sit in every single night. And there was a specialized light just for that one location. Wow. Uh, the lighting designer had worked with the client to find out where that furniture was going ahead of time. Um, the wife uh, had a large um, closet collection and they had worked to tune the colors specifically for each type of shoe uh, that she had had. And it was that level of detail and attention to detail that they paid that just blew me away. And I think that's what's so rewarding about light is it is so personal. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And, and Steve, what about project really impressed me. And Steve, what about you? Is there a project that you, you remember working on? You, no, you, there is. There's actually several that really come to mind, and they're all based around the same basic premise. Uh, one really sticks out is a client uh, was building a, I, I want to say roughly about an $18 million uh, a condo uh, in New York City, at roughly about uh, 4,000 square feet. 18 million and uh, they really had no appreciation for lighting uh, the architect put some holes in the ceiling but didn't select a fixture or a fixture type they, they just placed the fixtures the electrician was responsible for calling out what fixtures they were going to install and the the dealer got involved and said listen something doesn't seem right about this can you at least talk to them so i was fortunate enough to meet with this uh client and uh they came to the showroom, they saw what we offer, and I had to explain to them, what do they have in their home? I had to ask them the question, uh, what kind of artwork do you have? And he said, you know, we have things from old masters to contemporary pieces of art. And I said, well, how are you going to light them up? And he didn't have an answer. Uh, it's on the architectural plans, he said. Uh, I said, did you bring all the fabrics that I asked you to that you selected with the interior designer? And the answer said, yeah, I, I don't know what the meaning of that was for, but yeah, I brought a handful of them, not all of them. And so we laid them out on a table and I showed them how lights can change throughout the course of the day and how those fabrics on those seats, those cushions uh, would be affected. I also showed him how it would affect his artwork. You know, if this was a piece done by an old master that might have been done outside or by candlelight or gaslight uh, is one conversation. But then you have contemporary pieces that might have been done in a warehouse with I don't know, whatever kind of light source. It could be incandescent. It could have been an HID source. Who knows? Uh, and all of a sudden, you saw everything just, like, come to life. And this person's world just all of a sudden opened up and realized, I get it. Uh, long story short, they ended up changing the entire design. They hired a lighting consultant, uh, added probably a neighborhood of about a quarter million dollars to the project. Uh, and, and to this day, now they're looking at another home, and, and we're looking at that project, too. So wow. I think those are the most fun where you get to meet the client and, and talk them through this. Okay, last quick question for both of you. Um, what gadget hasn't been invented yet that you want? Do you have something you're waiting to be invented? I, I'm still waiting on uh, truly wireless power, so you don't even need <laughs> to run cables. <laughs> um, that, that, um, what I would actually love um, that someday is a blending of automation and lighting to the point where lighting can be predictive right now lights run on a prescriptive nature but um 
what I would love is if you pull out a book and all of a sudden a reading light comes on. Um, you you plate your dinner and the lights transition to a dinner scene. And um, I know there's some out there that that's a little too big brother for them. Um, but the best, going back to the theater days, some of the cues and looks that you would program, the audience never noticed. All they were do, there to do was to pull focus subtly, draw the attention so something else could happen on the other side of the stage um, or change the emotion. And I think that could happen in our everyday lives. Is light doesn't need to be thought of necessarily. It just needs to be perfect um, nope. and it needs to be right. I would what, love to have that capability. What about you, Steve? You know, I've had a lot of time to reflect, obviously, as most of us have being stuck at home. Uh, and I would say that uh, where this platform of Zoom and, and how to present uh, virtually as that starts to expand out, I'm excited to see where that goes. Uh, I think we all miss getting out there in front of our customers and being able to talk, whether it's lighting or not, especially lighting because it's, it's something visual. Uh, again, back to being an emotional piece uh, and see where that eventually leads to and how do we demonstrate easier, better, uh, virtually. Steve, thank you so much for all the knowledge you've shared with us. Can you give people an idea of the best way to uh, learn more about USAI? Oh, of course. Uh, so for the Bravas folks out there, it's uh, th there's several ways. Uh, again, reaching out to Savant or to USAILighting.com directly will work for you. Uh, USAI Lighting also has a fantastic uh, collaborative experience center in Soho, New York. They can come and visit us there where they can see, touch, and feel live product. Uh, use their own samples to demonstrate how things are going to look. Uh, so, again, that could be set up as well for an appointment only. And uh, then, again, from Savant directly, if you're familiar with Savant, those folks uh, can be there available to help you out as well. And I'll just tack on to the end there, uh, just so that the folks in our marketing department aren't upset. But um, your viewers or listeners, um, they can always follow us on Instagram, USAI Lighting, um, follow us on Facebook, um, LinkedIn. Uh, we try to post a lot of projects, um, but we've also had several individuals that reach out through those platforms asking questions, and we're always happy to get back to them. So um, don't hesitate. That was a great conversation. Thank you uh, very much. Thanks to both uh, you know, Steve and Greg for joining us uh, and being part of this. Well, we just want to thank both you and Bravis uh, for thinking of USAI Lighting and thinking of us and inviting us for this conversation. It's always a great fun time to talk about light and how we live. It is, and let's hope we can get some of these projects into our, our clients' houses. We're looking forward to it. All right. Well, from us and today, this episode, thank you very much. We'll see you next time.